flow path. So basically the flow path is kind of like a riverbed, right? And then you've got the water flowing in the riverbed and depending on uh, what's going on, the, the, the water may change course or uh, uh, if you have a flood, the, the flow path may change size, uh, may change direction depending on where things are coming from. So in your case, your flow path is composed of the compartments in a house. And the flow that we're talking about are the gases, the hot gases coming off the fire, and the inlet air that's going to the fire to feed the fire and help it grow. So we see at the top in this particular example, I'm gonna show you a video and some data. I guess I lied about the graphs. We got a few more graphs um, from this test setup. So we've got our, our bedroom here, it's 12 feet by 16 feet. We're gonna light, light a bed on fire in there and a couple of chairs and see how that develops. There's a five foot by five foot window that's initially going to be closed and then it's gonna be vented and that's gonna serve as our air inlet. That's gonna be a bi-directional vent. Hot gas is going out the top, fresh air coming in low. This is our room with the highest pressure. Then we have a 12 foot hallway. We have a target room adjacent to that hallway. The target room has a hollow core um, door right there. It's very typical for an interior door. Uh, inexpensive plain door like you'd uh, get at your lumber yard. And we're gonna look at a video view and a thermal imaging view inside that target room and see how that behaves while the fire is raging in the, uh, in the bedroom. As we go down this 12 foot hallway, we get into a living room that's also 12 feet by 16 feet wide. And then we dump out into a corridor as if this were in an apartment building. And the corridor goes 20 feet in one direction with no openings. And then it goes 24 feet in another direction with a opening at the ceiling. And that ceiling opening is intended to represent a stairwell door that's open to a stairwell, 36 inches by 80 inches. That's our low pressure vent. So high pressure gets moving through the structure and it's trying to go out the low pressure vent or out the top part of that window. As you might imagine, it's safer over here or if, if we had a wind condition, it would be safer on the upwind side than it would be making entry here and potentially putting yourself in the vent. How do they fight fires in New York City and all these apartment buildings? Well, they started writing it down when they had tenement buildings. And a tenement in New York City is about four stories high, could be six stories high. It doesn't have any corridors in it. It's got that winding staircase and in the center is typically a skylight to let natural light in because these things were built 100, 120 years ago. So they're trying to make good use of natural lights. So they've got skylights. And um, their fire procedure for the tenement building would be the horses would bring the engine up, the firefighters would get off the engine, the young guy would get sent to one of the exposure buildings, sent to the roof and go over a parapet wall. And his job was to eat, open that skylight and keep it open for the, the whole fire or open a bulkhead door that's up there and keep it open for the whole fire. Why? Vertical ventilation. The hot gases in the central stair are gonna go up and out the vent. The hose crew is gonna advance the line, sucking on their wet beard or sponge or whatever they were using at the time. The outside vent man is either gonna be on a rickety wood ladder or maybe on a uh, fire escape and he's gonna try to find the, the room of origin. He's gonna break that window and then get out of the way because he knows that heat and smoke are coming his way as soon as the hose crew opens up. They push heat and smoke out of the building, life is good, no problem. They go back to, to uh, feed the horses and, and go to another fire. Problem was, those were the exact same tactics that FDNY was using when they were fighting fires in buildings that were 40 stories tall, 10 stories tall, 30 stories tall, had corridors that were in excess of 100 feet long, stairwells, multiple stairwells, elevator shafts, and they were still telling the roof man, go to the roof, pop that door open and keep it open. And so effectively what they were doing is if their firefighters were coming down this hallway, they were putting them between where the fire was and by making the vent in the stair and the bulkhead door where the fire wanted to go. And again, depending on timing, depending on a lot of different things, they could do that many, many times successfully. But then there were also cases where the stars didn't align and firefighters got injured or killed. So that's what started this project. 
and uh, working, with, working with FDNY. The case I'm going to show you has no wind condition, only the ventilation that's caused by the fire itself. Again, we're using real fuels. That's extremely important to give you some ballparks and, and some visuals of heat release rate values. Trash containers, about 30 kilowatts there. We're showing it at its peak. Um, the chair is about 2,000 kilowatts or 2 megawatts. I'm rounding up here, 1.8 megawatts. So you've got your chair with flames six to eight feet above it, fully involved. A small sleeper sofa, sort of love seat size, is about two and a half megawatts, and a king size bed is a little more than four megawatts. Keep in mind, it only takes two megawatts of energy to flash over a residential scale room, say 14 by 14 with a single open door. So basically, as you saw in the previous videos before break, that single chair, that single 42 pound chair was enough to drive that room to flash over. So again, if you're thinking that, well, maybe the houses in my district aren't going to be fuel rich like we're talking about here, how many house fires have you gone to where there's only a single chair in the living room, right? So there's going to be plenty of fuel. So here we have our, our test video. Uh, in the upper left hand corner there, we're looking at our vent, the glass is still in place. We have our ignition room, the bedroom, so there you see the window off to the left hand side and the fire starting next to the bed. The thermal plume is going up, the hot gas layer is developing, the smoke is now starting to push down the hallway inside the apartment and we're starting to get a hot gas layer developing in the living room. Here's the corridor, the door between the living room and the hallway is open, so here's the video view toward the vent and here's a thermal imaging camera view where you can see the heat movement uh, flowing out of the door. So again, hot gas is up top, cold down here, perfect for firefighting conditions. Here's the video view and the thermal imaging view of the target room. So notice that the target room is still pretty clean at this point in time. The fire is darkening down. It's becoming even more fuel rich. It can't breathe. It's starting to pulse. It's looking for air. We vent the window. Watch how conditions throughout the structure change. We have a bi-directional vent, hot gas is out top, fresh air in low. What do we see in the corridor? Floor to ceiling heat movement. What do we see everywhere else in the flow path? Not much. The fire still does not have enough oxygen. So around six minutes, the door failed. Look at how conditions changed in the target room. Prior to door failure, the target room had oxygen, it was free of CO, it didn't have a lot of heat in it, right? That thin hollow core door bought that occupant time. Let's look at the heat release rate for this structure. Initially, we're around two kilowatts per meter squared. The window is vented and within 60 seconds, we're up over 13, I'm, not, I'm sorry, 13 megawatts, wrong unit, megawatts. Two megawatts to 13 megawatts in the space of about a minute. What about temperatures in the bedroom? At the ceiling, we're up over 1,100 degrees. As we get down here to one foot above the floor, we're sitting at about 500 degrees. Tenable for anybody? How about a protected firefighter? Eh, maybe not so much. Borderline, if they're, if they're hugging the floor, but I would say not so much. Then we break the window. So we go from an area where it's hotter at the ceiling and colder at the floor. Basically, we have a thermal gradient to a well-mixed environment in excess of 1,100 degrees. This is, again, our definition for flashover, right? Floor to ceiling burning over 1,100 degrees. So we transition to flashover by breaking that window. We call that a ventilation-induced flashover. The temperatures spike, and then they go back down. Why do the temperatures go back down? What's it missing? You can yell it out, it's okay. Oxygen, right? There's not enough oxygen to feed that fire. That's all right. You know, you're doing fine. I'll give you the 10 bucks later. Come on. Um, ventilation of the living room. So now we're in this living room that's basically has a 12 foot hallway separating that between, between that and the burn room. Again, we have a stratified environment where it's hotter at the ceiling, uh, sitting at around 500 degrees and colder near the floor, uh, less than 200 degrees. Is that tenable for a protective firefighter? Sure. 
Now, if your firefighter is in that room making entry, looking for the fire or doing a search or whatever, and that piece of glass breaks or somebody vents it, look how rapidly the conditions change for that firefighter, where now one foot above the floor is over 750 degrees. Three feet above the floor, where his head probably would be if he was crawling, is closer to 1,000 degrees. Is that tenable for a firefighter? Absolutely not. Would your firefighter see that coming? Absolutely not. If your firefighter had a flashover predictor, would they be able to predict that? Absolutely not. What drove that change? Breaking a window that's over 30 feet away from where he was crawling. This happens all the time. You'll have a team of firefighters, and at the moment, where they are is perfectly safe. Their gear can protect them. And then there's a dramatic change, and they're no longer safe. And the change is so violent, so extreme, they have no time to move. Or if they move, they can't move far enough. They can't change their conditions enough. And during the scenarios this afternoon, we'll talk a little bit about some of those cases. So again, we bumped up here in the living room, and it's still stratified. Now, you guys are learning about fire dynamics. Why is that still stratified? Why didn't that transition to flashover right away? What's it missing? Oxygen. Look at this peak. This peak happens at about six minutes into the burn. What big change happened where we were watching the video at about six minutes? The door failed. What was behind the door? Oxygen. That causes that spike. Here's where we start talking about velocity. We talked about convective heat transfer and how if you're in the heat that's moving with the velocity, your safe time is getting reduced dramatically. Before the window's broken, we have our ceiling jet, our hot gas layer is moving across the ceiling in the hallway at about five to six miles an hour. So that's one foot below the ceiling. If we go down to the point four feet below the ceiling or one foot above the floor, we hardly have any gas movement down there at all. Once that window fails, look at what happens. We get a well-mixed environment floor to ceiling with velocities ranging from, say, nine miles an hour to 13 miles an hour. So now you're in a hot convective flow if you were in that hallway. So not only did the temperatures increase dramatically, the airflow increased around you. You didn't happen to buy a new oven lately, did you? Man. If you go buy a new electric oven, what's the salesman going to try to sell you? A convection oven. And what's the difference between the plain old oven with the glow bars in it and the modern convection oven? It's got a fan in it because they want to increase the convective heating rate. They want to get, give that hot gas some velocity around the turkey. And what's the advantage of a convection oven? What's the selling point? You're going to use less energy and what? It's going to cook faster. It's going to cook that turkey faster. You don't want any of your guys to be that turkey that's cooking faster in that convective hot flow. Unburned hydrocarbons. Dan, what are you talking about? The science stuff. We've got 12% unburned hydrocarbons in the upper layer of the living room. So what that means is when stuff pyrolyzes and breaks down, even like wood products like OSB, you're generating things like acetylene, methane, fuel gases are coming off there, plus the, the uh, soot particles that can burn. So if we were to vent the bedroom, what do you think would happen? If we had another door to open on the bedroom, what do you think would happen? We're going to cool it off or is the fire going to get bigger? We got a lot of raw fuel in there, fire's going to get bigger. What happens if we cut a vent in the ceiling? Fire's going to get bigger. Right? You're not getting ahead of this fire with a pike pole until you burn the fuel out. If you want to fight this fire, you need to get control of those hot gases and cool them off and take them out of the combustion process. What happens if we do the same exact test and put a 20 mile an hour wind in this window? You're watching this in real time. Here's our inlet and here's our outlet of the apartment. Again, it's safe conditions for firefighters to be in the hallway right now. Once that window fails, watch how fast those conditions change. So within seconds, it went from being tenable, a tenable working environment for a fully protected firefighter to an untenable working environment for a fully protected firefighter. 
Notice for size up purposes how that fire is pulsing in and out. Even though we have a steady 20 mile an hour wind coming that's generated by a 350 Chevy with a six foot uh, propeller on it, steady wind, that fire is still pulsing in and out because the pressure caused by the wind and caused by the fire burning, increasing the pressure, basically can't relieve itself with this single open door. So it's basically got to burp and, re and relieve that pressure and that causes the pulsing. So if you're rolling up on a building and you see it pulsing like that, again, that's giving you a clue. You've got a wind impacted fire and uh, probably going in on the downwind side is not a good place to be. So we talked about neutral plane a little bit. Here's some examples uh, in some structure burns. Here's the neutral plane in this window. Hot gas is going out the top and fresh air going in low. So this is a bi-directional vent. Only the upper portion of this window has failed and so that's a unidirectional vent, full exhaust because again, uh, the, the le level of that opening is above where the level of the neutral plane is. Same story here, neutral plane in the doorway. This is full exhaust in that window. What about here? Here we have a, a townhouse type structure. And again, this is for size up purposes and we see a neutral plane in the front door. That's giving us an indication that there's a fire on the first floor. What about if you show up and you just have a smoky mess at the front door? That's a good indication you got a fire in the basement, right? Because that's saying that this front door is above the neutral plane of wherever that fire is trying to draw air. What about if you show up and you only have a little bit of smoke at the very top of the, top of the door? Might be you have a real small fire somewhere, or it could be you've got the fire that's above that vent. We had a great opportunity to do a number of experiments with Chicago Fire Department. All we were changing with these townhouse fires was the ventilation. We had a furnished living room, same kind of furniture, uh, furnished kitchens in the rear on the first floor. On the second floor, we've got a furnished bedroom in the rear, furnished bedroom up front. Uh, the doorway between the rear bedroom and the front bedroom, they were open for, on this hallway here. This door in the upper corner was always closed. That uh, environment in that upper corner always remain tenable for these short fires that we did. We're going to have a camera view here so you'll see fire coming up the steps. We've got a camera view here looking at the front window of the building and of course we have some views looking in at the uh, exterior as well as inside of the, at the living room. So we did test one set up very similar to this. We light the sofa on fire, we let the fire develop, we let it darken down, we let it run out of oxygen. Then we only open the front door. It's so fuel rich and we let the temperature drop enough that it took several minutes for it to, re to rebound, to, uh, to come back to a flashover. In this test, this is test two. We're gonna let the fire do the same thing, darken itself down. Then we're going to force open the front door and then we're gonna break this picture window shortly afterward. Remember, when we only opened the door, it took several minutes to transition to flashover. You're going to see something interesting happen right here. There's going to be a pressure imbalance because as this fire is darkening itself down, the gases are cooling, so they're shrinking, and that creates an overpressure in the basement that pushes the basement door open and pushes the door open in front of our camera. So that's the kind of pressure differentials you're starting to see moving around in this house as the fire's changing. The door's open, the window's broken, the window's cleared out. They're done clearing the window out about four minutes and 30 seconds. I would say that the fire is reacting favorably to the additional oxygen. Venting does not equal cooling when you're venting a fuel-rich environment. When that, envir when that box is full of hot gases, it's going to respond differently. So here's a, a different test. We're getting the fire going. Once we have the fire set, we're going to close the door. And the only opening to the exterior that's open right now is the lower part of this bedroom window. So I'm only going to show you the one view initially. You guys do the size up. Watch the clock. Again, I've got this sped up in the interest of time here, but, uh, but this is what the real time would be. So we're coming up on one minute and 30 seconds after ignition. The fire's developing inside. The hot gases are hitting the ceiling. The hot gases that are expanding are getting confined and they're creating an overpressure. And so they're push upstairs, path of least resistance, and out that window. 
they continue to build and they start to develop a pressure that's high enough to start to push around the door. And as the fire's growing, that push is going to be steady. When the fire's in the decay stage, you're going to see the, the gases coming around the door start to pulse. And then they're going to stop. So we're no longer pushing around the door. Watch the window. It's like somebody threw a switch. The gases have cooled off. They're no longer pushing. We make the vent. Now this, a nice flow path is established. Fresh air coming in low on the front door. Some gas is coming out the top of the door and the rest of the gas is unidirectional vent above the neutral plane in full exhaust mode out that window. Again, coordination. If you're the officer and you open the door and you need to take a look, see if there's any victims inside, you don't have the hose line ready, you can close the door again. Here they choose not to. What if as the officer, you looked in and only saw smoke. What if you sent a search crew ahead of the line? Within 80 seconds, this is the condition they're, they're dealing with. They're going to have to either come down through the flames or jump out a window. Now I'm going to let you see the views inside and outside. Same fire. Again, we're just lighting the fire on the, on the sofa in the living room. You see the ceiling jet hitting the ceiling and, and pushing back into the rear part of the first floor as well as smoke coming up the rear stair. Once the ceiling jet has hit the walls, we start to develop a hot gas layer. Now we have smoke moving into the front bedroom. This is the window here that's open. So I know that uh, Nancy Trench is a uh, advocate for smoke alarms. You can see why. Two and a half minutes, you've got smoke down to the floor in the bedrooms upstairs and flames starting to come up the stairway. Now the flames have stopped. Why? No oxygen. Fire's darkened down inside. The temperature's dropping dramatically inside. We open the door. There's the gravity current, the fresh air that's being entrained by the fire, which is acting as a pump. You see it, you get visibility back, you get a little bit of lift. So if you're coordinated and ready to go in and throw water, perfect. If you open the door and said, hey, we got to go get our hose line, you're going to burn this house down. We're going to take you through this step by step. Here's the graph I showed you earlier. So here's ignition. We're looking at the outside, the inside, the, the fire room and our, our fire growth curve for a ventilation limited fire or a fuel rich fire. There's the growth stage. There's the first fire peak. Now we have our, our initial decay due to lack of oxygen, still plenty of fuel. This is just due to lack of oxygen. And then five seconds after we open the door, it starts to ramp up again. And within 80 seconds, we've transitioned to post flashover on the first floor. So there's a view of, the, of uh, some of the furnishings. The living room's burned out. We have a little bit of thermal damage upstairs in the bedroom. This is one of the living room chairs by the front window. And here's the chairs in the kitchen. Notice that only the top part of the chairs has been damaged by heat. They've been pyrolyzed. Why didn't we have any flame in the kitchen when we saw flame filling the front door of the living room and, and headed outside? Went up the stairs. Why else didn't we have any fire in the kitchen? So we, we up, went up the stairs, another way of saying it wasn't in the flow path, and there's not enough oxygen. So if I would like to move the fire into that kitchen, what would be a good tactic? Open that rear door, break those rear windows. High pressure is going to go to the low pressure vent. The fuel rich uh, gases are going to mixed with the oxygen coming from the low pressure vent and the fire is going to move in that direction. Here's the data from the living room at the ceiling and one foot above the floor. The ceiling's up to almost uh, 1400 degrees or so. It runs out of oxygen. It drops down to about 400 degrees. That's a difference of a thousand degree drop. That's why those gases are contracting and we're having that difference in pressure. That's why it stopped pushing out the bedroom window. They're shrinking. We open the door, the fire gets the oxygen it wants, 
the heat release rate goes up and therefore the temperature goes up until we hit it with water and, and drop the temperatures down very quickly. Here's the conditions in the bedroom. At the ceiling in the bedroom, we're at about 1,000 degrees or so, and one foot above the floor, we're over 200 degrees. Is it tenable for an unprotected occupant in that bedroom? No. And what typically kills people in fire? Is it temperature? Smoke. And you saw how rapidly that smoke was up there, floor to ceiling. The fire is consuming the oxygen in the structure and replacing it with toxic gas. Very unhealthy for an unprotected civilian. Look at the time that that's occurring in. It's in the first three minutes from a flaming fire on the sofa. Did anybody even call you yet? Maybe not. So we're building up this uh, repository, looking at structural collapse fires in Phoenix, looking at uh, ventilation fires in uh, Chicago. Uh, we'd done the wind-driven fires in 2008 with FDNY in Chicago and Toledo and others. FDNY is sold. Their, their staff chiefs say, we have to protect our guys. We have to put these improved tools, these improved tactics in their hands. We're going to write our, rewrite our ventilation policies. We're going to rewrite our policies on fighting private dwelling fires, on fighting brownstone fires, on fighting fireproof multiple dwelling unit fires. There's 11,000 people, firefighters in FDNY. It's 11,000 opinions. How do you make that change? Well, one approach, they involved a lot of firefighters in these experiments, both the ones in 2008 as well as the ones in 2012. The other thing they did before these experiments is they held focus groups. Didn't matter if you were a chief or a firefighter, no uniforms, they had it at a neutral location. They just wanted to bring firefighters together to sit down and talk about What's keeping you from th putting water in the window? And they'd say, we took an oath to save lives. We're not giving up on the victims. So basically, this set of tests was designed not only to look at the firefighting tactics, but to look at what was more beneficial for any victim that might be viable inside, to overcome their concerns, that this is the best for you, and this is the best for any potential victims. So we had a series of row houses that we could work with. Again, similar arrangements inside. And uh, we had uh, two bedrooms that were upstairs at the top of the stairs that were pretty similar in size. In one, we would leave the door open. In the other one, we'd have the door closed. And we're taking gas concentrations and temperature and everything in there. So we could see what the effects of the fire downstairs would be. And again, we're loading these up with, uh, with typical furnishings. Here's the uh, front door and the rear stairs. Again, nice kitchens, carpeting, furniture. So we're not trying to limit the fuel load by any stretch of the imagination. We're trying to have a, a realistic fuel load in these buildings. And similarly in the basement. And in the basement, what we did was we erected some walls. So we would start a fire in the bedroom area and the living room area at the same time so that if we attacked the fire just through this 30 inch basement window, we knew that the hose stream itself was not reaching all the burning fuel. Same thing here if they attacked it from the, the Bilco doors walking into the uh, basement. And again, where's most of the fuel in the basement anyway? It's in the, it's in the flooring assembly. We should have a little volume on this, perhaps. So they just broke the window. Is that on the bedroom that's open to the hallway or closed? Closed, right? No flow path, no smoke coming out. Now they're going to move and vent the window that's open to the hallway. The fire is down on the first floor. Clearly opened up an exhaust vent, right? Now, is that making conditions in that bedroom better or worse right now? 
worse. So if your tactic for VEIS right now is to take the ladder and break the window and then get your SCBA hooked up and get your helmet on and climb to the window, which may take you 30 seconds, be pretty fast, or may take you a minute. And if there was a viable victim in there, you may not have done them a lot of good. So get, take the ladder, don't break the window, crawl to the top of the ladder, be ready to fight fire, and then make the decision whether or not you're going to break that window and make entry. What we did here is after the window was broken, 30 seconds later with a cable, we closed the door and you can see how the smoke flow has dropped off from that window now. So we're looking at the impact of isolating that room from the flow path. So initially, what did we do? We had a front door that's open. We've got a fire down in the living room area. The hot gases are, some of them are going out the front door. The majority of them are going upstairs, filling up the upstairs area. And uh, then we break this window. So by breaking that window, we made the burning on the first floor so much more efficient that the temperature at the bottom of the stairs went from 800 to 1800 degrees. The living room went from 800 to 1800 degrees. At the top of the stairs, it went from 350 near the ceiling to 950. In the open bedroom near the ceiling, it went from 350 to 600. And one foot above the floor, it went from 170 to 290. And we had a velocity of hot gases moving out of that window at about 15 miles an hour. The closed bedroom still remained tenable. If this is your wood stove and this is your air inlet, you just crank the damper wide open on the chimney and fired it up. <coughs> the trouble is, see, I don't have enough old people in this room. See, when I was a kid, you know, I had my 65 Mustang that I wish I still had, you know, very much. When I was in high school, what I needed to do on that beater Mustang as soon as I could was get that two-barrel carburetor off it and get a four-barrel carburetor on it so I could breathe, get a little more fuel in there. And what's the next piece of equipment that I needed? It was desperate. It was essential. I couldn't live without that piece of equipment. Them hooker headers, man. I needed to make that exhaust bigger so we could let that engine make more power. Horsepower is equivalent to heat release rate in your business, right? So in effect, we are opening up the exhaust and, uh, and giving it more power. What happens if we shut that exhaust down? Here's where we close the door. So the firefighter got inside, very quickly made their way to the door to isolate this room from the flow path. That even cools, has some impact downstairs because the fire can't breathe as, as well anymore. It's cooling down a little bit less than it heated up, but it's cooling down some. But look at the impact in the open bedroom. Once we close that door, ceiling temperature drops from 450 to 150, temperature above the floor, 170 to 120, and there's no velocity. Is this only good for protecting victims? There was an incident in Canada a number of years ago. Four firefighters had to bail out of a third story window. And they had the fire coming behind them. Uh, they had a very experienced captain uh, the captain made sure that the younger firefighters got out of the window first. He was taking a, a beating, uh, really getting severely burned. And uh, he eventually got out the window. Fortunately, despite broken bones, broken back, and, and burn injuries and whatnot, they all returned to the job. I had an opportunity to talk to that captain. I asked him, I said, did you ever think about closing the door? Right? If you would have closed the door to that apartment or closed the door to the room you were in, that would have bought you time. They could have brought you a ladder, you know, all sorts of things. You would have taken the heat off yourself. They weren't trained to do that, right? That was not in his uh, muscle memory. His muscle memory is, we gotta get out of here. And the feeling was they need to get out of there so fast, they jumped out of a three-story window. And we know there've been cases in the United States, Black Sunday fire, where those firefighters had a jump. Isolate yourself, train. Let's say you took another tact at this fire and you said, you know what, we're gonna pull the line off the engine right away and this really doesn't matter if you're showing up with 60 firefighters or two firefighters and said, when we have that front door open, we see the heavy smoke coming out of it, we're just gonna throw some water in there. That smoke's got velocity, it's got a lot of heat, 
It's heavy, dark smoke. We're going to throw water in there. Now, if you remember how this room was laid out, most of the burning furniture was off to the side of this hallway where they're taking the straight stream, 180 gallons a minute, and bouncing it off the ceiling. Look what the impact it has. Bottom of the stair temperature goes from 1,800 to 800. Top of the stairs, 900 to 500. Closed bedroom stays the same. Open bedroom, 600 at the ceiling, down to 350, 290 to 210 at the floor. The living room in the rear, 700 to 300. Living room at the front, 1,200 to 300. Why was it hotter initially at the front of the living room as opposed to the rear of the living room? Where's the air coming from, right? The flow path. Fresh air is coming in here, mixing, and it burns it all up before it gets back to the rear of the living room, so it's not as hot. But just flowing water for 30 seconds in there before you make entry, drop the gas temperatures down to about 300 degrees. Where did we hear 300 degrees earlier today? I don't know where those old guys got that back in the 50s from, but, you know, kind of interesting. So now what would happen? 300 degree temperature in here and somebody accidentally breaks that window. Do you have a concern about a ventilation induced flashover if you've got a crew in here searching? No. You took the gases out of play. That's the key. You've got to control the fire gases. It's not an issue that you've got a sofa that's on fire. Heck, your turnout gear is so good, if you wanted to get it all sticky and messy, you could just roll around on the sofa and probably put it out. The problem is that sofa's been on fire, burning inefficiently for five to 10 minutes before you got there, and it has filled the entire house with fuel gases that are, ready to, that are hot and ready to mix with oxygen and burn. And they can burn at such a flame spread rate that you cannot outrun it, right? They can move at 10 to 20 miles an hour. You're gonna be overrun by it. So it's really important to take those gases out of play. Take a lot of the what ifs. Here's a case where we're going to do a vertical vent at the top of the stairs. In this particular case, we had the most visitors because everybody thought, man, vertical, you guys have been goofing around with this horizontal vent. We understand that. This vertical vent is going to solve all our problems. So there's a four foot by four foot vent that's going to be popped open here at the top of the stairs. We've got the fire in the living room and we have the front door open. So we're looking in the first floor hallway. You can see the fresh air being drawn in. As we vented, the fresh air is coming in faster to feed the fire, and you'll notice that the intensity of the fire is increasing. So the vent to cool is not working here. So then we're going to close the front door and try to starve it. We've still got the vent, and that helps a little bit. That, that, that knocks the temperatures down, drops the fire a little bit. Now we're going to open the front door again. And now we're going to flow water from the bottom of the steps, just bouncing it off into the ceiling of the hall, trying to cool the gases off. Before we did that, sorry, I skipped a step. The fire grew to such an intensity that it auto-vented the rear windows. Now we're going to flow water. Do we see any pushing of fire out here? You're cooling the gases down. You're taking the heat out of the equation. So flowing water, 25 seconds, drop the temperatures in the living room from 1,500 to 250, 850 to 400, bottom of the stairs, 1,700 to 650, top of the stairs, 1,200 to 400, you get the idea. Again, interesting, the air from the, the door is mixing with the hot gases, 1,700 degrees here, mixing from the window with hot gases, 1,500 degrees back here, and in the middle, it's the coolest temperature. Still not a survivable temperature, but it's cooler because it doesn't have the oxygen supply to burn efficiently. Let's look at basement fires a little bit. And if you don't have a lot of basements in town, just consider this as operating above the fire floor. Again, when we go back to this is how we've always done it, we discussed that there was the most effective and efficient fire attack is from the interior. That's the traditional thinking. We want to attack the basements from the interior and get firefighters at the top of the stairs to protect the search. But why are these fires a challenge? Well, they're ventilation limited, typically. And uh, in mo more modern construction, it's not so much an old cellar that has little teeny tiny windows in it, but many of these basements have uh, fire exit windows in them. They have walkout doors. So you can get a pretty dramatic change in ventilation. The current SOPs which place the firefighters 
on over fire and combustible construction, we have collapse hazards we're going to talk about here and also again put the firefighters at the top of the chimney. In previous editions of fire training manuals, they would show a very elegant artist rendering of a firefighter at the top of the stairs with the smoke uh, gently going above their head and them forcing their way down the basement. And in some cases, depending on what era you grew up in, they would tell you if you just slide down your belly, as soon as you get down the basement, it's gonna get cooler down here and everything's okay. Again, if you don't have any ventilation down here, that's the case. If you have a source of ventilation down here, now you're really just, here's your inlet, here's your outlet, this is going to be a unidirectional flow up those stairs, putting the firefighter in harm's way. So we did some experiments with Underwriters Laboratory, and we looked at dimensional lumber, we looked at um, engineered lumber, we looked at trusses, we looked at lightweight steel. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you a little bit of this video. Notice how when we go from the contents of this basement being on fire to the basement being on fire itself. The worst place you can have fuel is at the ceiling, right? The hot gases are going up there. That's the best area for heat transfer. And that's where the oxygen gets consumed the first. So you're going to start pumping out a lot of unburned, uncombusted fuel gases. This is upstairs on the first floor. And you can see that we've already got flames that are coming up the basement stair. Notice that when the structure itself started on fire, how rapidly the fire went from one side of the room to the other and flames start coming up the stairs. Right now we have uh, vents, uh, we have an open door and an open window in the basement and the upstairs door is open. 1500 degrees the ceiling, 400 one foot above the floor and changing rapidly. 750 one foot above the floor. So if, let's say, you followed the guidance to slide down on your belly, and if you get down there quick, you'll be able to deal with this. It's going to be cooler near the floor. That is absolutely not true. It's 1,100 degrees, one foot above the floor. This is side A or the front of the house. So do we see a nice neutral plane, or do we see what? Smoky mess. We're going to change our view here and look at the rear side C of the structure. And then you'll see where the neutral plane is. So there you see we have a, the door and the window. We ran these in two different configurations. One we called max ventilation, where the door and the window were open at the start of the fire, which is, is this case. And then we had another one where this would be closed, this door would be closed, and the front door upstairs would be closed for eight minutes. Then we'd have the fire department arrive, open the front door, and then later come around the rear and open the, uh, the rear vents. This being the, the wood eye construction, um, we're going to see a pretty significant collapse of the floor system wall to wall. Hang in there, about 10, 10 seconds away. There you go. So the whole front part of the first floor collapsed. So if you look at the series of tests that were done, and again, max vent is with the vents open at the beginning, and the sequenced vent is when we we didn't start opening up them up till eight minutes into the fire. You can see how long the assemblies lasted from the ignition time, and you can also see how long the floor assemblies lasted from the time that they caught fire until they collapsed. So this is your dimensional lumber, your two by 12s, uh, seven minutes and, and just shy of 11 minutes. The engineered wood eye joist, 245, four minutes, 442, 229, two and a half minutes kind of thing. The steel joists, five minutes and 10 minutes. Parallel cord trusses uh, with no vents, lasted almost four minutes. 
with maximum vent less than two minutes after they caught fire. All of these times are within your operational time frame. There is no 20 minutes of safe time. It's just not there. Where did it come from? Sean DeCrane, battalion chief with Cleveland, was kind enough to take a uh, truck company and cut some floors out of some abandoned houses that they had in Cleveland. They're built around 1920. Rough cut lumber, full dimension two by eights. Brought those to UL under the NIST grant and put them in the floor furnace. What do you think their failure time was in the floor furnace? 18 minutes. 100% load, floor furnace pretty, pretty intense exposure. The modern lumber was failing at eight minutes under the same exposure conditions. It's not the same lumber. If you look at the edges, the growth rings are different. The, the newer lumber has growth rings that are like every quarter inch, right? Sustainable lumber, all this stuff, genetically grown, all that kind of thing, right? The older lumber, um, you'd have four or five growth rings for every quarter inch. Different materials, different strength. So the things that may have been true at one time that you've got about 20 minutes are certainly no longer true today. And here's just some views of the post-fire damage. So you can see how they come apart. The dimensional lumber loses its cross-sectional area by burning until it can't support the load anymore and then it ruptures. The engineered wood eyes, they lose the web very quickly. That affects their structural integrity. And then the floor starts to sag until it ruptures. Uh, the steel gets soft very quickly, exposed to heat. This deflection is greater than six feet. That's where the floor level was up there and this is six feet below it. And of course, the parallel cord trusses, they're being held together by these gang nails or nail plates. Uh, once the connection is, um, is lost, these lose their structural integrity. You don't have to burn through the two by four for them to lose their structural integrity. That's why they're failing so quickly. So what happens if we follow the, the current thinking in some departments and we send a crew inside with a hose line and we position them at the top of the stairs of a basement fire to protect the search and they have to start flowing water because they're getting hot. So we're flowing 180 gallons per minute of water basically making a water curtain in this uh, stairway down to the basement. You notice we're not having much impact on the basement fire down here. We don't see anything dramatic happening one way or the other. So what happens in terms of temperature? Well in the front of the basement uh, it goes from 1,200 to 1,500 degrees because we're stirring up some air down there, allowing it to burn a little better. The rear of the basement sits at about 750 near the ceiling. Uh, the front door cools off a little bit at the top of the front door. And the top of the stairs at the ceiling above the firefighter's head drops from 600 to 400. And the heat flux at three feet above the floor goes from 21 kilowatts per meter squared down to seven. So that's, that's a good reduction. The firefighter would feel some positive effect there. Not much change in the closed bedroom or the open bedroom. One of the challenges here is the thought is that the fire is going to come up the stairs. In many cases, coming up the stairs may not be the path of least resistance. In these fires, typically what happened is the fire came up the pipe chases into the kitchen and flashed over the kitchen and dropped the kitchen floor. So here's the 30 inch by 30 inch window out here that you can see. And there's the hangers for the joists. So if you've got your crew taking their line in here at the top of the stairs and this occurs back here, could burn through their line, trap them, etc., may not be a good choice. Let's look at this. Let's say before you take that charge line in the front stairs to protect, and to protect the stairs inside, just throw some water in that window first. So the water's going in the window. We're looking at the thermal imaging view at the top of the basement stairs. In the flow path, are we seeing any significant change in energy coming up the stairs. Are we seeing billows of scalding steam? Superheated gases blowing up the stairs hurting the firefighters or anybody else? Why not? Smooth board could be straight stream, but that, that is an important point. We've been talking about expansion of gases that get heated and contraction of gases when they get cooled. From Firefighter 1, I know it's one of the test questions, 
When you take a gallon of water and you put it into a thousand degree hot gas layer, how many times is it going to expand? 1,600, 1,700 times, right? Now, what happens if you take that same gas layer and cool it from 1,800 degrees or so down to 300 to 200 degrees? It contracts. It shrinks. So as long as you're applying water effectively and efficiently, you're not generating a whole bunch of excess steam. You're putting the fire out and cooling it down and causing those hot combustion gases to contract. Let's look at our temperatures. Water in the window, basement front goes from 1,700 to 300, 1,200 to 400 at the stairs, rear of the basement 800 to 300, front door drops 50 degrees from 250 to 200, we go from 600 to 200 at the top of the stairs where the firefighters would be. Heat flux goes from 14 kilowatts per meter squared to zero. And we even get a little bit of cooling in the open bedroom. Pushing fire. Well, you don't want to, again, the old thinking, don't, push, don't flow water from the outside, you'll push fire. What does pushing fire mean? And it has to do, in some cases, with nozzle choice. But again, let's look at the impact of flowing water from the outside. We see the living room cools off, the bedroom cools off, closed bedroom stays the same, top of the stairs, bottom of the stairs, very positive. We go to some single family structures in Spartanburg. So here's your size up. You're using a thermal imaging camera for size up, so we got the video view and the thermal imaging view side by side. The officer's doing the 360, you're trying to look for the hot spots. So far, nothing has vented on this structure. It's pretty clear, right, with the thermal imager. And even in the, the visible view, you see where the smoke's coming from. What do you want to do as the company officer? It's your fire. You could open the front door. Nice thing about opening the front door is once you open it, you can always close it. Take a peek inside while your guys are pulling the line, see if there's any victims there. You can also see if you can see the fire. If there's no opening to that room where you think the fire is and your firefighters would have to go down a six or eight foot hall or there's debris in the hall or you can't tell what's in the hall, you may decide to close the door and have them just take the window and throw water in that room. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the window. Ideally, you would be applying water right now, but we're trying to see if we can get the fire to heat up a little bit with the window open. Notice that the window is not nearly as efficient as opening a door in terms of getting fresh air into that room. So we get a little water in there. It might have been a kink in the line or two. We get a little more water in there. So by opening the window, the living room temperature at the ceiling went from 600 degrees F to 700 degrees F. One foot above the floor, it stayed at 200 degrees, um, untenable in the living room. The kitchen, uh, gases are untenable in the kitchen in the, in the open rear bedroom. You can see it's 100 degrees on the floor, so you're not going to get a burn injury necessarily if you got a victim on the floor. Uh, but notice um, we have a little bit increase not much increase in the bedroom. We don't have a lot of flow because this is our flow path right here. If we were to break this bedroom window, what would happen? We would pull heat through the house toward that, toward that room. Uh, this bedroom right here that's adjacent to the fire room, this door is closed. It's just the interior door that was on the house when we got there. We closed that door and you can see that that front bedroom at the ceiling sitting at 120 degrees. One foot above the floor at 70 degrees. We've got 20% oxygen, 1% CO2, no CO at uh, four feet above the floor, and no heat flux. Now we apply water. Temperature in the living room for the ceiling goes from 700 to 100. Kitchen drops from 450 to 300 at the ceiling, no change at the floor. The rear bedroom back here goes from 300 to 250, no change at the floor. Uh, middle bedroom, 
uh, 300 to 250, no change at the floor. Heat flux drops a little bit. And again, the front bedroom still clean. So if you had a viable victim in here, what's the best course of action? Are we steaming them? Do we see any evidence of scalding water going in the back there? Absolutely not. Quickly getting this fire knocked down, opening up the building, make an entry. Once you have this fire knocked here, can you break that window without worrying about drawing the fire back to that victim? Sure. So you can do a lot of different things once you've taken this potential energy out of the picture. So in Spartanburg, we did a set of houses on one side of the street that was sort of, let's think about this, and this is the ideal way. And then the other side of the street was, ah, this is more like what happens on the fire ground. So we have an interior view, and uh, this is with some uh, a uh, brand new furniture that was purchased for the experiment, so we know it's very representative of modern furniture. Our side A exterior view is over here on the left. We start to see some smoke coming out from around the eaves. We're getting a pretty good gas layer building up in the, uh, in the living room. We've got rollover in the living room. And do we achieve flashover in the living room? Not yet. It darkened down, it ran out of oxygen. The fire's losing its heat release right now. The officer's starting their size up. We've got a heck of a smoky mess all over. They're gonna make a decision to open the front door. They open the front door, the pressure in the house basically pushes the door closed. It's open for a little bit, now it's closed again. Even opening the front door a little bit, you saw the impact it had on the flames now starting to vent out the windows. So they're gonna go back and uh, they're gonna open the door again. And now between the open door and the two windows that are starting to self-vent, the fire's really going to take off. Watch how the small amount of water, this is from a straight stream, that actually goes into the fire compartment, right there. What did it do to the fire? Darken it down. So here's the impact of opening the door and having the two windows open. The living room at the ceiling goes from 1100 to 1400. Notice that where our thermocouple array is right here uh, in front of the door in between the door and the sofa, the temperature at one foot drops a little bit. That's because that fresh air is coming in low and dropping the temperature from 400 to 300. The kitchen just behind the, the fire room ceiling goes up to 700. Uh, on the floor, it's going from 200 to 300. Uh, the front bedroom, again, is closed off. You notice that that's maintaining good temperatures, plenty of oxygen, uh, no CO2, no CO, and a little bit of heat flux when the uh, flames start rolling the porch and, and getting light in the window. The rear bedroom is also closed, and that's staying tenable. The middle bedroom here is open. Uh, ceiling temperatures go from 600 to 700. At one foot above the floor, it's going from 200 to 300, and the heat flux is at 4 kilowatts per meter squared. So basically, you've got no viable victims in any part of this building that's open to this fire room. The only place you've got people that could be rescued are people that are behind a closed door. Impact of water through the front door. Drops the living room temperatures at the ceiling from 1400 to 200. Kitchen back here goes from 700 to 200. At the floor, it goes from 300 to 100 Fahrenheit. The middle bedroom, which is also open at the floor, goes from 300 to 100 Fahrenheit. The heat flux goes from four kilowatts to one kilowatt. Again, if we were blowing um, more energy back there, this would go up and not down. The front bedroom remains tenable. A little bit of water before you go in, go in search. Let's say that um, you got to that house and made the choice of uh, making sure that your priority is getting this door open before anything else. 
let's say you're on your belly, you're, you're crawling low, it was around uh, 300 degrees or so there, and, and you could make it in. You didn't feel any heat. And he said, man, I gotta pop open that door. I gotta see if there's a victim there. I gotta save them. Without putting water on that fire first, are you doing them any favors? Not at all. Unless they were wearing their SCBA and their turnout gear when they went to sleep. So let's do a little more flash, or a little more uh, size up drill here. You jump off the rig. You're not doing your 360. You're, you're trying to come up real quick to see what's happening. You, you see a little bit of smoke. You don't see a lot of fire. You're certain that people are savable in there. You want to do your best job. Where do you think the fire is? Got a neutral plane at the front door or a smoky mess? More like smoky mess, right? Let's keep walking. Well, you can't see anything with the naked eye, but what do you see with the thermal imager? What do you think that is? Is it a fire on the first floor? Is the fire coming from the basement? You can talk amongst yourselves at lunch, but this afternoon we want more discussion. <laughs> Let's keep walking. The importance of the 360. Now with the thermal imager, you're certainly starting to see some heat sources very low. And now with the naked eye as we continue around the house, you're going to see some smoke coming out around the foundation. So you're getting more clues that the fire's probably in the basement. Once we get around the corner to side C, you're going to see where the fire is getting its air. You're going to see where the neutral plane is, and you're going to understand what this fire is all about. And there it is. Take some of the mystery away. Notice that the window sills here are higher than the neutral plane, so the basement windows are all unidirectional, full exhaust. So it's really important to size up and understand what you're working with. To the extent you can, you want to try to attack the fire on its own level. So they're going to bring a hose line from the street, and uh, as, as they're dragging it down, start throwing water in these windows and then into the door. Again, not a whole lot of water is actually getting in the windows, but notice how rapidly the fire disappeared from that doorway. Notice now we're getting some steam generation, right? We're not being as effective. Once we get it in the doorway here, we'll be able to, uh, to knock it even better. So they basically went around. All together, it was about 60 seconds of water application. Dropped the temperatures in the basement from 1,800 to 400. Temperatures in the bedrooms upstairs all came down, and we had a, uh, some instrumentation on firefighter turnout gear to represent a firefighter about three feet off the floor. Gear temperature went from 300 to 200, heat flux went down, uh, living room temperatures went down. So again, you're not doing anything bad anywhere else in the house, even though we've got this flow path open. Here we had a situation where we started the fire in the middle of a room. We let it spread to the kitchen. The way we let it spread to the kitchen is by having these windows open. The windows back here are closed. The door back here is closed. You see that the rear of the room, the temperatures are low, 500 degrees the ceiling, 600 degrees the ceiling where we started the fire, and 1400 degrees the ceiling where it's got the air. We applied water through the window. Again, a smooth bore bounced it off the ceiling so we have a broken stream and dropped the temperatures throughout the structure. Again, why can't we push fire through this structure? Number one, we don't have a flow path. All the, all the air exchange is going on right here. And number two, what's missing in this room? What's missing in this room? Why aren't these temperatures higher to start with? There's not enough oxygen to feed the fire. The only way you can push fire is by displacing hot fuel gases to another area where there's oxygen that they can pick up and burn. 
If you've got a pressurized box here that only has one inlet and outlet right here, you can't push fire anywhere, even if you use the wrong nozzle. Here we have a situation where we've got a fire on the second floor. Here's the front door, the front door's open. And what we were looking at was uh, this, here's the fire room, we're in the hallway at the top of the stairs. We're looking at the condition that the victim made it out of the burn room, but collapsed right here. Are we going to hurt them if we apply water in this window? Well, what do you see my camera's getting covered with immediately? Cold water. In the bedroom, 1,000 degrees at the ceiling, 900 degrees, three feet above the floor, 400 degrees, one foot above the floor. Drop the temperatures with the hose stream. In the hallway, it was 900 degrees, one foot below the ceiling, uh, three feet above the floor. We're at 400 degrees, went to 200 degrees, and one foot above the floor, the temperature increased by about 20 degrees. A little bit of mixing. Uh, the cameras that you saw were down here getting wet. Choice of weapons. I've got two bedrooms that are similarly furnished and they're at the top of the stairs. They're connected by this hallway that you can see at the top of the stairs. The stair goes down to the rear of the structure and the door at the bottom of the stairs is open. Here we're gonna use a, a straight stream, bounce it off the ceiling, 150 gallons a minute. Then we're gonna inappropriately use a fog nozzle to block that vent on the other side. Let's look at the difference. So whether it's a smooth bore or a straight stream, you're bouncing it off the ceiling, you're giving it a broken stream, you're basically putting a big sprinkler in that room, you're cooling the gases and taking them out of play. Did we see anything bad happen in the stairwell? Now we are going to take a fog nozzle or we could take a fan and we can block this vent. Did we get a push? Yeah. Once the water actually starts getting in there, it stops. You don't want to use your straight stream. You don't want to whip it around at that window and, and block the vent either. You can, you can become a, uh, a poor quality fog nozzle. You want to let this vent work. You want to introduce the straight stream in there, bounce it off ceiling, move it slowly back and forth. Don't whip it around in a circle and block that vent. Let that vent work and get the water in at the same time and life will be good. If you take something like a fog nozzle, which is pretty much the same as putting a fan with about a five mile an hour push on it, you're increasing the pressure. What did I tell you about pressure? High pressure goes to low pressure and you're changing the flow of the hot gases, which you saw pushed down the stairs. Right, so choice of tools is important. Here you saw a little bit of this earlier. The NIST webpage, uh, ISFSI has a lot of uh, free training materials, uh, ulfirefightersafety.com, cfitrainer.net. All these have been funded by uh, the assistance of firefighter grants from DHS FEMA, and so they're free to you to use, free for you to use. NYU Poly, you can even use them on your smartphones and, and get educated while you've got some free time. Uh, IFF has a YouTube television channel. Uh, Derek Alconis, who's our next speaker, has a lot of information on their good stuff. And this is his website. He'll tell you more about that. Fantastic. Um, the Governor's Island, the entire study, is located at modernfirebehavior.com. And again, your one-stop shopping, your portal, is FSTAR, where you can find the links to all of these. And um, that's my email address. If you have questions, you can follow the work of my group on Twitter. And uh, with that, I'm going to give you guys a very short 10-minute break, stick to 10 minutes, and then Chief Alconis will come up and, and start going through some scenarios before lunch. Thank you.